Uh, I guess this isn't really Palo Alto. It's the Independent Duchy of Stanford with its own police force. There's an actual sheriff of Stanford. Yes, he's an actual uh, captain from some county sheriff's department that they contract with. But they bring him in and say, OK, you're the sheriff of Stanford now. What ho, sheriff? Welcome to Stanford. Uh, and strangely enough, he reports to the, I don't know, the provost, the dean of whatever, the, the head banana, instead of, uh, you know, any kind of uh, governmental. <laughs> Stanford University, a wholly owned subsidiary of, no, wait, uh, I digress. Uh, all right, so that was my introduction. Uh, Ting? This is Ting. OK, thank you. <laughs> and a man who needs no introduction, chairman for life, George Perry. Earlier we were talking about decades. And I thought of centuries, because like the 20th century began in, what, 1901. But the 20s began in 1920. And the difference is that the 20s are literally the 20s. I'm celebrating, or I'm enjoying the beginnings of my own eighth decade of life. A turtle can live over a century, but there are no boundaries. You don't start on any particular year, except the year of birth. So while this is the 21st century by our reckoning. It's already the 20s because it's 2020. Also, we were talking at lunch about uh, modem protocols. My favorite modem protocol of all time was leech modem. Before the, when there were ratios to see how elite you were, uh, before they started counting the actual kilobytes, they would. Uh, count how many files you uploaded and download. Leech modem would exchange handshake on all of the packets except the last packet. It would receive the packet and without reporting back a checksum saying, I've got it to say, what? what? You don't know me. And so folks would build up huge uh, leech modem. Uh, don't bother asking for it by name because now it's all bytes rather than packages. But thanks, lunch crowd, for the flashback. Politics, I'll see you guys later. You can see this snazzy shirt I'm wearing. The person largely responsible for this edition of the SV Fake t-shirt. Our esteemed uh, videographer and web uh, stream meister and t-shirt guy. Also presenting later in a few minutes I can hardly wait, Brad. Indeed. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> Sam also presenting later today. Sam Falvo, person behind the Castro Three and other sundry things. All right. Hi, I'm John. Hi, John. John's scanning forth stuff. Archive. Do you want to talk about the archives and what's there and how to access it on the FIG, SV FIG website and what else is in there and how people send you stuff and you can scan it into our repository and stuff maybe next month? Yes. Yeah. OK. We will definitely do that. All right. All right then. We are the archivists. Giving him boxes. I'm Dennis Roofer and retired. <laughs> John Ryder. Uh, uh, odds and ends of stuff. What's on a drive around the country, October, November, 10,500 miles in my new 87 VW van. No, no, no. 
One of the last, yeah. Uh, one of the last stops I made was at Chuck Moore's house way out in Nevada. Um, apparently one of the only people to have visited him there. Uh, we had to cut it short because it was the day before the big storm hit at the end of November. And I was intending to come back over Highway 4 at its pass and so on. And uh, when I stopped for gas that morning in Bridgeport, a Caltrans person said, hey, we're going to be closing that road about 6 o'clock tonight, or before if it starts. So I, Chuck and I had a late morning, uh, quick lunch, and conversations together for a few hours. Headed back. He is in the boonies out there, but because of line of sight, he has free internet. They put a repeater on his property and have he has free access to high speed internet uh, because of the sight of it. Doesn't always get good cell phone, sometimes uh, it's occluded, but again, He's up high enough for a line of sight to some of the ones along uh, 395. Boom. Hi. <clears throat> I'm still Dave ja Jaffe. And I'll be your host here at Stanford until we're kicked out. <laughs> I'm Miles Williams, uh, just visiting. Thank you for coming, Miles. I wanted to mention one of the joys of Windows 10. You've probably heard me complain, oh, you know, I've got all these devices and I don't want to go over to Linux because I, I got them talking to Linux once and it was painful and I'm not sure I could do it again. So my devices are keeping me from Linux. Well, it turns out my devices are keeping me from Windows 10, or Windows 10 is keeping me from my devices. I have a LaserJet 6P that I've been using to print black and white stuff for quite some time. Uh, perfectly serviceable, good printer in my opinion. I'm not sure the, how available the toner cartridges are. But Windows 10, it's, it's a real painful uh, process to get a generic PCL driver to talk to it. Uh, I learned how to do it mostly and then said, it's too much trouble and I don't want to be doing it on my other Windows 10 computers and the computers that I'm going to be converting from Windows 7. So for less than $100, I bought a, a modern, a slightly smaller, maybe not as good HP printer that uh, will suit my needs that has a driver from uh, Windows 10. Uh, it's clever enough to look at the toner cartridge and say, yes, that's a genuine toner cartridge. I will deign to print with your toner. Uh, <laughs> And in fact, we'll report that the toner cartridge is genuine. So if your cartridge isn't genuine, are they going to send the police to your house? No, I think that it just refuses to print. I, I don't know. I don't want to try it. I will buy genuine toner cartridges. Uh, I don't print that much, even though I'm old and I like the paper copy of the Granger catalog. I don't so intend to find out. I don't intend to find out. You know, there was one company that actually licensed their toner cartridge. They didn't sell you a toner cartridge. They licensed it to you so that uh, basically they could, under the Digital Millennium Crapola Act, they could uh, sue you for, uh, or if you were a, uh, a toner cartridge refiller, they could sue you for reverse engineering their toner cartridge in an unwarranted or undesirable fashion. 
Uh, so you basically don't own anything anymore. You don't own the, uh, the rights to repair your car or your John Deere tractor. Uh, Well, you know, Microsoft owns Windows 10, including all instances of Windows 10. <laughs> all right, don't get me started. So if anybody wants a LaserJet 6P, I'm sure, I'm utterly certain, having done so, you can get Linux to talk to your LaserJet 6P. See me at the break. Hopefully I can bring it in next month and hand it over to you. If you live in the Bay Area, I will just bring it to you tomorrow if that's really what you want. <laughs> All right. Maybe uh, while I'm blathering some more, uh, Brad can make his uh, way to the front of the room and get set up and good, good to go. Uh, Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, okay, so um, uh, the motivation of uh, this talk is that uh, uh, after some number of years uh, using other methods, uh, I decided to move my uh, my personal website to, to run on fourth. Um, in that migration, I wanted to. Uh, keep the existing content uh, and uh, to also add some dynamic content to convince myself that I could do that. Um, what I used to do was I had it on App Engine um, and uh, had a bunch of static content, so I was largely not taking advantage of the capabilities of App Engine. Um, and uh, it consisted of a bunch of Python scripts and templates. And uh, it had a bunch of features uh, that I sort of didn't, didn't actually use. I, I set up a bunch of stuff under the notion that I was going to write a bunch and then didn't actually write, as, as often happens. 
Uh, and so it had facilities for topics and categories. So I thought it was a chance to reduce some of the complexity. So one of the reasons I decided to move it was, uh, was App Engine, which uh, is getting, getting on in years now at Google's longstanding uh, scalable web solution. Um, it, it, is, uh, it is still cool in the sense that it uh, allows you to uh, put up content and sort of not have to think about it uh, in terms of uh, running as a service. Uh, it has runtimes for a variety of languages and then if you design your app according to the uh, sort of dictates of, uh, of their APIs, it will, uh, it will nominally scale. Uh, and uh, it has the virtue that if you're um, if you actually do uh, sort of use it uh, outside of the, the, the lines of its expected pattern of usage, um, you will actually pretty rapidly fall over. So you, you kind of know you're not going it, to, it's not going to scale well before it doesn't scale. But the flip side of that is that you actually put a lot of bother into uh, getting something that will scale even if you're, you have a low traffic website. Um, the uh, primary reason I had stuff there was uh, because it, it was free and it was sort of, in my, in my head it was always like, well if I was going to you know, put a dead hand switch somewhere, like this would be the thing because it had been the same way for years. You could put something up, it would just keep running. And it continues to. Um, the, uh, uh, you, you have a configuration file on app.yaml that sort of describes the layout of stuff. Um, uh, and it, uh, in, in a form, continues to be free. However, something changed recently which uh, kind of nudged me uh, away from it uh, for, for personal projects. Uh, I'm sure it would be a lovely solution if you were trying to scale uh, and cared about that dimension of it. And I still have Fourth Haiku up on it uh, for that, partially for that reason and partially because I don't. <laughs> Baby steps, maybe. <laughs> um, but the thing that changed is that up until uh, uh, recent versions, uh, when you had Python code and I believe also Node.js, uh, I'm not sure, I don't work, I, I'm not sure what Go and Java actually off the top of my head. Um, what it would do is that you would you could upload to it and uh, you would upload source code and uh, the act of doing that upload was sort of sufficient to put to deploy uh, to it. Um, but starting in recent versions of the runtime, which they have now sort of turned the knob such that you, for new pushes, you have to deploy uh, to those new versions. Uh, you you now need to do a compilation step and. Uh, for reasons I'm un, un, unsure of, that compilation step cannot be done on your local system. You need to compile in the cloud. Um, and so uh, that then in turn turns into something where, it, well, in theory you can operate uh, and it leaves something running uh, with no billing and whatnot associated with it. If you want to be able to compile in the cloud, then you need to pull out the credit card, have an account associated with it. And so the ability to continuously update something requires a, a presence. So I thought, well, if I'm going to do that, at that point I might as well look at the other options uh, available because uh, once you have taken out that credit card for, for a Google Cloud account, a bunch of other things open up. Uh, and there are a number of free or, or semi-free tiers to it. So. Um, the old solution was a bunch of uh, Python templates that uh, were sort of all the GARP that I wanted to put on each page. And, uh, sorry, did you have a question? Uh, would it be accurate to understand that engine is uh, competitive, competitive with Elastic Beanstalk? Uh, um, so I'm not super familiar with Amazon's offerings. That I would, uh, it, it, if it's uh, if it's sort of got prescribed API and like particular data. So App Engine has uh, you have to use their style of data store. You can talk to a bunch of Google APIs. You have to use particular frameworks for the the, the, the structure of the web app. Um, responses have to happen within a certain window, uh, but it but it scales arbitrarily. I'm not sure if that matches up exactly with with Be Elastic Beanstalk, but um, the uh, uh, I used a bunch of templates um, because I was uninterested for this piece of content, Fourth Haiku is a whole other story, uh, in doing anything dynamic at the time. All of this happens ahead of time, so a bunch of data files um, that get chewed through and then turned into uh, content. So basically, big Python script, a bunch of inline uh, HTML, 
and then that content gets turned into a table of contents, gets sorted into categories uh, uh, for topics, and then uh, sorted in various ways. Um, way over, so sort of way overkill even for the small amount that I'd written. Um, and, and then it, you know, bla uh, and then it was just being deployed as static content. So, yeah, so I had this notion of topics and in practice there were, there was just not enough content. Maybe, maybe I, I need to be more disciplined about my, my writing, but if you look at it, it's a, it's a sad tale of not, not very much happening there, so. Um, so the new solution, um, I wanted to have some, some dynamic content just to, just because I could. And um, I wanted to go uh, swing in even after a bunch of experiments. So initially I thought, oh, well, I'll just take the same thing and rewrite it in fourth. I'll have fourth do the text processing and, and, and either do, you know, uh, generate stuff or maybe I'll even, you know, uh, have all of the, con the templates filled out live. And I started down that path and then it dawned on me that this isn't actually sort of what I was trying to accomplish. What I was trying to accomplish is to, to simplify what I have to make it easier to deploy in different places. And so I realized that for the actual static content, I just wanted uh, to, to be as uh, sort of pure, pure, uh, uh, pure HTML and, and some JavaScript as I could. Um, and uh, so doing super minimalistic markup, um, I then uh, moved it to a, a cloud server uh, that's basically just a, 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 a Linux box running conventional stuff. We'll talk about that in a sec. Um, and then for the parts that are dynamic, that's where I've put in a gateway to fourth. So the, the articles are now something like this. They, they literally are just bare tags um, and then a, a piece of script at the top that uh, injects in a bunch of CSS and junks, it, it restructures some of it uh, that, I, that I was either too lazy or, 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 or my CSS foo was insufficient to transform the stuff in the way I wanted. Um, it's nice because now the, the thing that's being deployed is the thing that I edit, and that's for the, the articles themselves, that's simpler. Um, the, um, uh, uh, the one bit of sort of manualness to it that isn't ideal is that the table of contents has to be duplicated, but uh, after years of having, you know, d done something similar for a bunch of my, t the, the table of contents for my talks, it's not the end of the world to copy a little blurb about a thing, uh, especially as it's unlikely to change. So uh, uh, Google Cloud uh, Compute Engine ha offers virtual machines in the cloud. You can get a, uh, there's a, a set of free quotas as a number of folks like Amazon have as well, where you can basically get about a year's worth of uh, one wimpy uh, Debian server with, you know, 600 megs of RAM and, uh, 100 gig disk, uh, uh, basically under the free caps. I, in the process, I've been playing around with a few other things that I'll, I, I'm not going to talk about in this talk. Uh, so I'm, you know, br brimming over to spend two dollars a month, but it's not, you know, um, but, it, but for this, it's effectively under the cap. Um, you can just install arbitrary Linux stuff, and, including GeForce, and, and that's nice. But you do need to keep a credit card on file with them. Um, and you can put in, if you're, you know, worried about brimming over, you can put in spending caps and all, all the rest. Um, in, in looking for how to do this, I, I decided to, uh, my, my, most of my past experience was with, with Apache 2, and looking around, I realized that uh, uh, Nginx, or I don't know how you pronounce it, uh, is, is, uh, seems to have caught on in popularity for its simplicity. Uh, it's a little, it's got a slightly simpler, nicer configuration. Uh, than Apache do. Apache's gotten a bunch of uh, hairy things over time, uh, and uh, in particular has a nice facility for, for uh, SCGI, uh, which sort of has a slightly better uh, 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 claim about its uh, stability on the tin than the one for Apache. Um, and then, uh, but I wanted to use this as a chance to do some dynamic content. Um, so web, web pages that are, you know, do something where the server actually participates in the interaction. So fourth haiku, for example, does this, stores the haikus and all of that. Um, but up until this point, the, my personal web, website didn't have uh, anything of that sort. So you can do, you know, simple things like a web counter or, or something complex like a web app. Um, what I've got at the moment, you'll we'll see in a moment, but... Um, so how to plug it in, um, there's the old standby, CGI, um, 
the uh, couple of downsides to CGI, uh, not least of which that you've got to, you know, so CGI works as a, um, uh, each request comes in and uh, a script gets fired up per request. Um, and uh, you can certainly, you know, deal with this in, in forth. The, the parameters that come in from the request uh, go into a bunch of environment variables. So uh, you get uh, an HTTP request looks something like this and, you know, has the, the method and the request and the, the, the protocol version and, and then a bunch of fields. And uh, this gets parsed by the, the web server. Oops, that's what a reply looks like. But CGI, you know, gives all this to you in, in the environment. Um, the major downside is, of course, one process per, per request. Um, the, um, and then you're, you're obliged to reply. Um, there are a bunch of um, alternatives to this. Um, one that's very popular is fast CGI. Um, and I considered this for a little bit. Uh, it lets you have the web server uh, act as a gateway to uh, a, another server. And then you, uh, you communicate with that server over a pipe or a domain socket. Um, and it has support for a lot of things. And so uh, you can, it, it can sort of mix uh, whether it's spinning up, uh, dealing with one or multiple uh, connections to the, to the, uh, the whatever daemon you want to run. Um, but because of that complexity, it, it's, uh, it's a complex, because of that flexibility, it's, it's a fairly complex protocol in the scheme of things. Um, another alternative, uh, the, and the one that I ended up going with, is a, a thing called uh, SCGI, or for Simple uh, uh, Common Gateway Interface. Um, it's nice because the spec is 100 lines. That's a, that's a good selling point. Um, and it's a very straightforward format. Basically, it has uh, a series, basically a size count comes in, and then it lists a series of uh, all the parameters that you would get with CGI with nulls between them. And so you can read this in basically in one chunk. Uh, and uh, it's sort of trivial to parse because you're just walking down looking for nulls. Um, it has a drawback in relation to fast CGI, which is that uh, you're, uh, it's opening up a, section, a separate connection per, uh, per request, but you can have a persistent server sitting there responding to it. Um, so it looks, oh yeah, the request looks something like this, right? You get a, a size count literally as, a, as an ASCII set of integers, a colon, and then you get a series of, uh, you know, uh, variable, null, value, null, variable, so, and so on. Um, and then at the very end, you get the, uh, at the very end, you get the, uh, the body of the request, if there is one. Uh, and then you just reply, uh, essentially, with the, um, with, the, uh, with the same kind of reply that you would give if you were the web server yourself. Um, and then you close the connection when you're done. So, uh, Another option is uh, a proxy. So um, you could, uh, you know, it, HTTP is a fairly simple protocol. Um, one of the reasons, by the way, for using any of these proxies is that um, I, I um, want to have um, a, uh, uh, an HTTPS website uh, with, a, with, a, with a certificate. Um, and I certainly don't want to implement that from scratch. Uh, SSL is a non-trivial protocol. Um, but another option is that you could have the, the main web server proxy traffic. Um, HTTP is a little more complex than, than SCGI. And from what I could, uh, what I could tell, uh, the guarantees for SCGI are a little stronger in terms of how sanitized the request is coming through. A proxy, in a lot of cases, just passes content straight through. One of the general problems with all of this stuff is if you're going to have something sitting on the internet these days, you want to be cautious about what it is and how vulnerable it is, especially if it's written in a low-level language. Um, the other nice thing is, uh, especially as I wanted to, to do some, some uh, somewhat interesting things with the uh, connections, um, so SCGI opens a separate connection per request um, and then hangs up. Uh, where where uh, the HTTP protocol itself is able to uh, keep the channel open and send multiple requests. And so uh, with uh, Nginx sitting in between, you can have it uh, deal with keeping the connection open and managing multiple requests coming over the same connection. Um, 
and, and then it transforms each of those into a, a request to the um, uh, to your to your separate server. Um, that's nice because then you get the benefit of uh, of keeping the connection open, and because all of this is transiting just the, the local system, uh, the overhead is not too bad. In fact, there are actually some folks that have benchmarked it versus uh, fast CGI, and there's depending on who you talk to, it sounds as if there there are claims that the simplicity of uh, SCGI sort of and the simplicity of the implementations ends up uh, making the uh, winning out in terms of overall efficiency, even though you would think having more, more ability to multiplex would be better. Um, one downside versus a proxy is a little bit of a pain to test because you're running something that isn't a web server and to test it, you basically need some kind of a web server. And so even in my local system, I have to run a local server that I've locked down to be on the local system to be able to talk to it. That's, that's the one sort of regret I have with that approach. Um, the, uh, the other thing that uh, this move did that, that I'm happy about is, um, so um, uh, previously I had been using a, a, a Let's Encrypt uh, certificate for uh, uh, the site. Let's Encrypt is a, a, a nonprofit that now is the certificate authority that now uh, uh, basically doles out free, uh, free certificates. This used to be a thing that you had to, to get at great hassle and, and, and sometimes cost them like a hundred bucks or so. Um, the, uh, the one sort of downside that's kind of intentional is that they offer a fairly short expiration. So there's a, a process where you have to renew the certificate peri uh, periodically on the order of like three months. Um, the, uh, the nice thing about moving away from App Engine is that the integration with Let's Encrypt is, uh, is done by a, a program called CertBot. Uh, well, actually, that's one of several ways you can do it. Um, with App Engine, it was a little bit tedious because you had to actually um, use CertBot to renew your certificate and then uh, upload this through the, through the console. There was not a, a, an easy programmatic way to update the certificate uh, if it was deployed to App Engine. Um, with uh, with uh, Nginx, uh, there's really great integration. You basically run this once and then it, can, it will basically in the background manage that, the renewal of that certificate and, and does all the, all the right things. Um, so super, super easy, and I, I actually, it, I would say that with App Engine, it was taking me on the order of like, you know, maybe like five, ten minutes to, to go through the whole process of renewal, and even though I had written down each step, it was a it was sort of a tedious thing to do, because it's like, okay, do this step, get the certificate, confirm that it didn't, you, uh, that it, and each, oh, and each, I should say, each time you have to um, prove that you control the website by putting up a, an authentication file on the site. So the act of renewing the certificate involved deploying something to the website, which is a big hassle. Um, and that's, their, that's the reason they do that is that they, they're offering these free certificates. They're trying to get folks to, to, to use HTTPS. That's the underlying goal is that there's a big push in the web community to get all the traffic encrypted. Um, but the, the flip side of that is that they want to have a simple way to verify that you're the proper holder of the certificate, and the easiest thing to do is to have you deploy something and, and confirm this. And there's a bunch of other protocols that can be used under the covers to do this, but effectively what they're doing is putting something on the website to demonstrate you have control of it so that then they're confident that they can give you a signed certificate. Um, so very much easier. All right. But uh, still the problem remains uh, talking to POSIX because uh, now I've got the problem, I've decomposed the problem, I've got my static content, and then I need to have my, uh, for all the dynamic content, I need to have my fourth daemon running um, and talking to the world. Um, GeForth has uh, a, a nice facility in it uh, for, for talking to the outside world. It has some drawbacks, um, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but essentially what it does is it on the fly compiles uh, little uh, dynamic linked stubs. Uh, and, and so it literally goes out and uh, if you do slash C, put some C code, it dumps this into a, a file, goes out and compiles this, and then you can uh, build little, little stub bridges uh, to that code. Um, the, the good thing is it's fairly general and, and you always have the option to sort of bail out and if something is too complex to deal with uh, in terms of fourth and a structure, you can write a little bit of C code to glue uh, between the two. And uh, when we look at the code, I've done that in a few places. Um, 
one interesting thing I came across, and I, I actually just literally last night was in correspondence with the, the G4 authors. Um, uh, uh, as it turns out, the version of G4, um, if you go and look at the GNU website, you know, you'll see 0 0.73, and that's the one that's deployed in all the package managers. Turns out it's not the latest. There, is, there are newer versions, um, although uh, uh, I clarified uh, with uh, um, uh, Anton and folks that uh, they, they consider that the, the last sort of stable release. Um, 0 0.79, uh, there's actually a number of random little bugs that have actually been sorted out in, that, that are in 7.3, which are kind of annoying around the interface. There's some warnings and things that, that uh, come out. The other fascinating thing is there is this uh, 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 facility called ABI code that, uh, that uh, a paper went out uh, uh, quite a while back on uh, that's present baked into 7.9. Uh, but um, basically what it lets you do, uh, which is kind of cool, uh, is that they, they come up, so the, the issue backing up a bit, G4 being portable um, has the, the substantial disadvantage that depending on what your compiler does, um, you don't actually know what registers are going to be used for what things in, the, in the, uh, the fourth code. So for any one build, you can look and see, oh, it looks like it's basically keeping the top of the stack in this register, but you know, different compiler, different version, different phases of the moon, you get something different. Um, so it makes it uh, extremely uh, uh, tedious to actually, in practice, do code words um, if you wanted to say call us, us call directly or something of that sort. Um, the clever idea is to have um, a sort of a single uh, uh, type left relation for uh, how you would call into fourth um, from uh, into the into a fourth implemented in C, um, where you pass in the stack pointer, pass in a pointer to the to the uh, uh, floating point star, sorry, stat pass in the, stat the, the top of the, the, uh, the stack pointer itself versus passing in a pointer to the stack pointer for the floating point stack. Um, and then by, uh, on the vast majority of uh, the architectures that are out there, um, what this means is that you will, uh, you will actually then know what registers you're going to get because C has a well-prescribed uh, ABI. Um, on each of the different, uh, for each of the different uh, OSs. And so you'll, uh, you'll, you'll know exactly which register this is. And this one in particular on both um, x86-64 on ARM and then on uh, x86-32 X86 ends up being one that gets uh, 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 disposed of. The point being that you can, you do have to do a little bit of a dance to pull something over into the return value. But if you're not using floating point, you can essentially leave it alone, which is nice. So, you, so for, for integer words, everything sort of gracefully goes through. Um, and then you have to sort of carefully arrange to, uh, for that. So that's another option. Um, uh, after some fiddling around with this and then deciding that I didn't want to be on a version of G4 that isn't sort of wild, widely out there, I, I kind of went into my old standby and uh, used those external words. One downside to this sort of thing uh, it compiles on the fly, um, and it will compile by default at each time you start the application, which isn't great for startup performance. Um, what you can do is have a declaration around it, labeling them with a, a name, and then it will compile once and store it cached under that name in the home directory. The downside is if you've got a daemon, that means you have to give the daemon a home directory. Um, and, uh, and, and then you have to be careful that if you change anything that you've, uh, that you've brought in that way, you need to bump the name of that, uh, that layer. And so I have a, uh, as you'll see later, I have a, a POSIX, uh, bunch of POSIX uh, functions imported, and then a number just counting up each time I fiddle with it. Um, and that way I can keep a cached copy of it so that the start time is fast. Although a long running server, it probably doesn't actually matter. Um, number of sort of sidetracks uh, along this process. One thing I, I, I learned along the way that I had never encountered before, I thought I'd share this, it might, might be an interest to this audience. Um, I, um, thinking about the, the API surface that I was interacting with, I got to thinking, you know, this is kind of weird, the chronology of like how various POSIX APIs work. And one thing I came across that I found fascinating is that early Unix got by without things like select. Um, and uh, without the ability to do uh, non-blocking I.O. And a lot of how this worked is that you would just, if you needed to do something that required 
concurrency, you would fork and you would potentially wake yourself back up synchronously across the pipe. Um, and so the, the idea would be um, if you've got a, uh, even if you've got multi-directional uh, communication, you, you can come up with all these wonderful little patterns of sort of waking yourself up and unblocking yourself up, which is, which is kind of fascinating. Um, it very much hinges on uh, the, the assumption that you're, uh, you're managing all the pipes yourself. It completely falls over when you want to have a daemon because the issue is then you don't have any way to, uh, to uh, bring in new connections. So I'm describing that badly and I probably will write that up somewhere to, to be more clear. The other you know, fascinating part of that is that, uh, is that uh, pipes then become essential because that's your, sort of your building block to build up any of this stuff. And so having the guarantee that you can write and read from the pipes uh, and send a whole message atomically becomes very important to, to do this sort of thing. But quickly, people discovered, you know, it, it's even, even, uh, you know, even with copy on write, you've got all kinds of challenges in terms of performance there. Um, yes? Yes, it does. <laughs> Indeed. Um, because I had that, so all that is to say that was why, why processes were on my mind. And so when I, when I came time to uh, come up with this SCGI server, I thought to myself, you know, I'll do this with processes this time instead of threads, as I would have ordinarily done. So threads versus processes, you know, there's shared address space versus copy and write. And, uh, but there is this, this advantage of separation of concerns. And I, I have to say, like, the, the nice sort of thing about relying on these other frameworks and having them on the, on, on the web was I didn't have to sort of worry too deeply about security. But if I'm going to put low-level code on the web, I'm going to be a little bit concerned about security. So I thought, okay, I'll have them in separate pro I'll have each, each worker in a separate process. Um, the other thing that's nice is interacting with these APIs from forth, it's, uh, uh, it's simpler, right? You've got fork, and it returns an integer, right? It's a, it's a very simple, nice word to call, or same thing with call pipe. You get back two things, you know, it's not... Uh, in comparison, pthreads has a good deal number, larger number of parameters and uh, things of that sort. So, um, for bridging sockets, um, and uh, they're fortunately Unix, they're, they're, they behave like files. I rely on a bunch of, uh, a little bit of C code to, for setup because there's a couple of places with sockets where you have to set up a structure. It has to be just so. Um, and then um, for sharing between workers, originally, having learned this fascinating thing about these, these sort of intricate patterns of communication with, uh, with early Unix and pipes, I toyed with the idea of, oh, I'll do this all with messages over pipes. Um, I eventually uh, got lazy and dissuaded myself self of this shared memory is just delightful. And so I, I, I in particular, for uh, the particular kind of little toy dynamic things that I decided to end up doing, it was simpler to just have a block of shared memory uh, and to use uh, uh, semaphores to, to communicate and wake things up. Um, I came up with a very simple sh pattern for this. Basically, most of the content, what I had in mind, as you'll see in a moment, was things that are on the website visible to all users where they're all interacting with some shared state. So if one user changes something, I want all the other users to be able to see it. So in, in a number of cases, it's useful to await anything changing and then wake up and wake everybody up. So sort of think, uh, mutex wrapped condition variable where your only operation is you just wake everyone up. Um, and you, but you can do that on top of a semaphore with a little bit of care. Uh, actually, a couple of semaphores, unfortunately. Um, this lets you do some fun things, like you can ha just have a clock pulse where you just periodically wake things up. Um, and uh, oh, wait, one, one thing, by the way, this is, this is another sort of little pattern that came up as I was doing this. And I, um, I, I, for whatever reason, I feel like this is the first time I've had a long-running piece of fourth code. I don't know. I'm mean, shocked that this is the case this far in. But um, I, so I ran into a few situations where I had stuff been running for, for a while. Uh, and then I, I uh, had Stack Overflow and didn't realize it. And so I, you know, it's like, oh, gosh, I've never, you know. And so making sure that you didn't actually accidentally leave something on the stack became important. So I found, I found that this was an awfully handy pattern of like, you know, grounded everywhere. <laughs> nope, this should be, the stack, stack gap should be zero here. Um, and and uh, that, that, that did wonders for sort of uh, weeding out those stack leaks. But I, having never, never previously had to care about such things, 
you know, with a, with a relatively large stack. But you leave something running long enough and enough requests and you, you run into these. So uh, be curious if there are other, other pearls of wisdom from folks on, on that sort of point. Mm -hmm. uh, mm, yeah, asserting that you've got, yeah. Preconditions and stuff. Yeah. It's, it's the same yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, definitely a flavor of that. Yeah, I see that. Um, so the other thing, by the way, that I wanted to, and one of the reasons I had the synchronization pattern with the awake and, and, and await uh, stuff is that I wanted to, for one of the, the, the things that I put, put together, um, and I have aspirations for more, as you'll, you'll see in a minute, but um, uh, so there's this thing called uh, HTTP long polling. So what I wanted to be able to do is have multiple people go to the website, be able to see something, interact with it, and have something happen on multiple machines. And um, HTTP is a protocol where you make a request, you get a reply. So how do you, how do you make something happen uh, like that? What you do um, is you, you get the request, and then you hold on to it for a while. You say, well, I'm not going to actually answer you yet because the TCP connection will stay alive and I'll wait until there's some relevant event. And this is a, uh, a way to, to have a fairly fast uh, dissemination of something. So you have a bunch of clients that all say, okay, tell me the state now, great. Tell me the state now, but I've already got this state. And then they all sit there in a holding pattern until you either time out and have to ask again or you, you suddenly have some reason to tell them something and then you wake things up and, and proceed. Um, and so this, this actually works reasonably well, as you'll, you'll see, and we'll demonstrate this. So I made, built two things to start, and I've got, I'm going to probably do others in later time, later, later talks perhaps, but ran out of time. So uh, I, I built a, uh, a classic thing in the web would be a web counter of how many visitors, but I thought, well, that's, that's boring. I'll do, a, I'll do a, a sort of a heat map of the IP addresses that have, have shown up uh, just to see what that looks like. Um, and then the other one is just a, a sort of a shared uh, a thing that you can interact with. Uh, and let's now go over to the demos. So, um, so this is the website. Um, one thing you'll notice if you watch really quickly when I hit reload here, you'll see that loading in the corner. And what that is is that the, um, uh, if you, uh, what's happening on the page is the, the, there's a bunch of, uh, there's a bunch of JS and, and uh, CSS that isn't there immediately. And so it temporarily puts up that loading screen to give you an idea of what that looks like. Let's say I go into one of these articles here uh, locally, and then I'm going to, uh, I'll just comment out the, uh, the part where, where I, uh, actually load the, uh, the script that drives it. And if I, um, if I open that up, um, that's what's, what's actually there, sort of the simplest possible markup you could have, which is, you know, kind of, uh, uh and what you would get if you, if you actually were in a browser that had, uh, had JavaScript turned off. Uh, whereas if you uh, have the script in place, then uh, then you get the, the formatting and all of that. Um, the other thing is that I, uh, for those of you that remember way back, I, I added this, um, and there's no comments in this article. Actually, no comments because it's in the local system. Um, I, I'm using this uh, um, service called Disquis uh, that lets you embed a, a forum and they keep the, the forum contents. I have to say the act of moving this over and actually paying attention to the load times of these pages has made me wonder a little bit whether I really want to keep these on here. There's fairly, unlike the haikus where there's a little bit of discussion going on with some of them, um, for the, perhaps my articles are dull, um, but uh, the, uh, there's very little discussion in here and then watching how many tracking cookies come down from this service um, and not just tracking cookies but like some amount of like crazy other stuff uh, monitoring the page. I'm beginning to think that I'm, I'm uh, <laughs> I, this is not maybe a thing I want to have on my website. I'm still figuring that out, but uh, um, I preserved it as is for now just because I wanted to confirm that I could. Um, so that's that. So, um, so anyways, the, um, the articles are, you know, the handful of articles are still here. 
um, and, and their various uh, content. But the, thing, the new thing that I've added is uh, this heat map. And uh, so each, each visitor uh, the, that uh, shows up here um, adds a, a, a dot. The, the, uh, the x-axis is the, uh, the first, uh, uh, there's a 256 pixels across, and so it's the first, uh, uh, first octet of the, uh, the IP address, and then the second octet, and then there's a little line there just so I can, you can pick them out on a, on a dark background. Um, I'll be fascinated to see how this accumulates over time. Once upon a time, uh, the first two digits especially of IP addresses were nominally associated with geography and, and whatnot, um, although now, now it's been chopped up and, and uh, uh, sold around uh, quite a bit. Um, so we'll see. I, I, I briefly toyed with thinking about ways to maybe hash it and look for um, uh, incorporate all four digits, but I decided, nah, it'd be more interesting to just see the first two and, and see where it goes. But that means that, for instance, if folks in this room access it, probably we look like a single, a single uh, dot on that, on that map. So, um, so that's the thing one. Um, thing number two uh, is, uh, has some shared state, and this tag, yes, yeah, somebody tapped the page. There you go. <laughs> exactly. And so uh, everybody who taps on the page moves around the one shared object, and it should be, in theory, instantaneous. So if folks go to flagzer.com, they should be able to uh, move it around, and you should be able to, you know, simultaneously, oh wait, you can see the screen up there already, but yeah. So I'm assuming Sam is pecking away at it, and you know, no, over there. <laughs> so um, probably we'll try to do something more with it. The nice thing about this is that, is that when it's sitting there stationary, and no clicking is happening, there's basically no networking happening. So it's in a holding pattern, waiting for the web server, holding the connection open, and then the moment uh, someone clicks, then it wakes up and, and notifies each of them of the change, which is sort of what you would ideally want. Um, there, there is a time, so there's a timeout, it's every, uh, so there's debate as to how long you can sort of safely go because what will happen is if you wait too long, um, some of the, the networking hardware in between may time out the connection. Um, uh, the, the estimates vary from about 15 seconds to 30 seconds, and so I, I put in a 15 second time. So after 15 second seconds, uh, the server gives up and just sends out a thing, and then it makes a new request and, and continues on. And so uh, it's, the, the, main, the main goal is just to avoid continuous polling, right? So you're, 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 you're potentially waiting, but not, you know, not too long. Um, let's, let's take an ever so brief uh, peek on the inside. So, um, so uh, as we, let's see, with the articles, right, straightforward, and, and the nice thing here is that I can just sort of write, it was already the case, unfortunately, that the articles were fairly plain and vanilla, and most of why I had templates in play uh, was to do things that, that uh, I didn't end up using. So. Having this all in, uh, in, uh, in JavaScript and CSS is just, just simpler. Um, the, uh, let's see, so, so that's all of the, um, actually, um, the, um, these web toys, so the, it's all, all very relatively straightforward. So for the, um, let's look at the, uh, look at the, uh, all that's happening with the long polling is that I'm doing a post and then waiting, and then when I get that, I, uh, I, I, uh, I will I update uh, and redraw the board, basically, each time I get a, a message. And so you send a click, and then that updates things. Um, but let's look at the, the fourth side of it, which is more interesting. So the fourth stuff lives in here. Um, I, I've set it up as a daemon, so there's like a there's like a, a bash script that wraps it to, to actually be a uh, to be a persistent thing that runs, um, and then the main uh, the main thing here is is just this. Um, so I've got a bunch of uh, plumbing for POSIX. Actually, I don't need to import the POSIX one anyways. That's <laughs> I've got an extra line there, but um, so I've got a um, uh, I've got a wrapper that handles SCGI, and we'll, we'll look at that in a moment, and then it's just uh, waiting on, an, on a local port, uh, and then the, the web server is configured to go to that port for all the traffic under a certain directory. Um, and then in, uh, I've got a word param that pulls out uh, HTTP params, leaves them on the stack, 
um, and then lets me you know, do a comparison to see, okay, am I at this address or that address? And then I route things to different, different places. The two things I've got on there are the, the, the IP tracker and, the, and the, the board toy. So the IP tracker um, uh, has, so I've got them wrapped in, a, uh, wrapped in a vocabulary just to make them private, but basically I, um, I open a big data file uh, with, a, um, uh, with a, a, a 256 by 256 one bit bitmap. Um, and uh, I am map it so that, uh, so that it's shared between uh, files. This one is persistent because I want it to, be, to persist between you know, runs of the thing. Um, and then uh, I've got a word save to, to do an msync to force it to disk uh, just for good measure largely. Um, and then when a request comes in, um, so, so when a request comes in, I respond with the uh, you know, 200 OK, and then I'm going to respond in bytes. And then I mark the IP uh, that it came from uh, in, in that bitmap, save it, um, and then dump the bitmap back out. So I'm just letting them write one bit in based on their IP, and then returning the whole bitmap to them. Uh, and then there's JS that displays it. For the, the clicky fourth thing, um, it's a similar but slightly different story. So um, I'm uh, handling input, which is the part where I actually do the long pulling. So the way that works is um, I've got a, uh, a parameter that I pass in as the query string that I convert uh, to a number. So it's just a number that's counting what generation am I. And so uh, initially everything's zero, but every time there's a mutation of the of the position, that counter gets incremented by one. And so if you contact the web server with the wrong number, it knows to respond immediately. Whereas if you contact it with the correct number, then the assumption is that you're, you're already up to date. So it can then, uh, it can then, uh, so you either interact, uh, yeah, so sorry, there's an earlier branch point where it's deciding either you're sending a message to interact and move the position or you stall. And then the way that it stalls, which is the interesting bit, is that it decides if that counter matches and then waits. Um, and that await can be woken up either by the pulsating timeout or by uh, when you do a, uh, an interaction. I advance the counter, save the state, and then wake up everybody else. So if there's one or if there's 20 people waiting, uh, watching the counter, they will all get woken up and, then, uh, and they'll respond and interact. So, um, and similarly, I just dumped back out the board state. Um, originally, when I put this together, I had imagined actually having a bunch of little objects to interact with, and I just, yeah, I didn't, didn't have time. I'll probably add more to it where there'll be a little more, more things to click around, but for the moment, it's one thing. And, uh, but right now, it's actually sending, you know, a, a bunch of different state variables back and forth. Um, let's look inside here. So the... Um, uh, the um, await and awake are a little bit interesting. So what I ended up uh, what I ended up doing is uh, having a let's see. Um, let me make sure I'm describing this right. So I have a um, um, so I actually put the the, the uh, semaphores for the. Uh, um, for the synchronization into a uh, into an mmapped region, so that it's shared memory between the different uh, processes, and then I'm uh, and then I have a uh, uh, a guard that's think of it like a, a mutex wrapped around the thing, and then I uh, I have a, a set of uh, uh, waiters that I need to wake up, and so it, I'm basically building um, building a uh, a queue of folks that are sitting there waiting uh, to be woken uh, and then went, uh, and then locking that queue, uh, locking the, the whole thing, releasing them all, and then, rele and then releasing the, the wrapper to it. Um, and then, um, let's see. So the, the actual, uh, this is, that was, this is the whole SCGI implementation. Um, 
it's not too bad. So I have a canned set of workers, um, and oh, there's my ground word. <laughs> um, I have a, oh, that's actually, sorry, that's dead code. Ignore that part. <laughs> um, so um, I, the way I deal with parsing, uh, because this is such a simple protocol, what I can get away with is I just have a 64K buffer. Um, I uh, uh, keep track of just the, the size of the buffer. Um, I, just out of uh, extreme caution, I clear the buffer every time I get a request. Um, and as I um, do a single large read into the buffer, I assume that I won't get a request bigger than 64K. Um, and then I have words uh, next zero to let me skip through the nulls and be able to pull out individual parameters. And so that lets me implement uh, a word that given, uh, given a particular parameter, goes and finds it in this list if it's there, um, and, or, or returns empty if it's not there. Uh, and then that lets me pull out individual HTTP parameters. Uh, that could probably be more efficient. I have some words for emitting uh, text. I, uh, I chose R as the prefix for response. So it'll type to, to the response or put a carriage return to the response um, and emit lines there. Um, and then uh, there's some plumbing here to handle multiple requests and the key the key thing here is that uh, the um, uh, I have a this run operation where I do some setup and then loop and fork uh, a bunch of workers. And the way fork works, for, for those of you unfamiliar, you call fork and suddenly now your, your process is, you've got a new process, you're either in the new process or the old process. If you're in the old process, you get back the, the process identifier of the process. So it's non-zero, or if you're in the new process, you get a zero. So basically you get, create a child. If you're in the child, it goes and runs this handle all word, and then, uh, and then otherwise it keeps looping and emitting those. And then it sits there uh, in the, uh, uh, sorry, it, this, is, this is a, a duplication of, uh, or sorry, this is waiting for all of the children to finish. And so if all the children die, then it, then it exits. And so then each child is uh, basically just doing a bind to, or sorry, that's, that's the setup. Each child is just handling one request, so it waits for a request um, and then handles it. And, uh, and then that routes it to uh, whatever, whatever you passed in. So that the, from the point of view, this is the interface that folks can use on the outside. They can respond with these different statuses for the, you know, yes, this is an okay page and I've got raw bytes or I've got plain text or I've got HTML. Um, and you can also, if you want to admit like a large bunch of inline text, I've got this r slash word. So that is, that is that. Are there any questions? Go to flagzor.com and tap on the fourth thing and it should, everybody in the should see it move as we, <laughs> or I have bugs. <laughs> yes, you can move things on the screen, but only while the screen is up there. Flagzor.com, it should, yeah. It, yes. Uh-huh. Yep. Uh-huh. write a thing to allow users to point the camera at some in the room? Probably, yes. Bleep, bleep, bleep. Depends on what the device is and if I have some other way of controlling it. Now people are moving things around. This is good. No, I want it in the upper left-hand corner. <laughs> So I, I may embellish this with some, some more interesting set of objects that maybe you can drag around or something, but we'll, we'll see. Okay, going once.
It's, it's actually a little bit early, but since everything else has been a little bit early. On with the show. So my name is Sam Falvo, which you'll see here in a bit on my title slide of awesomeness. Um, but before I actually get into my talk proper, I want to show something real quick. Um, it's nothing terribly large, um, but it's uh, basically this program, which apparently does absolutely nothing except print out, you know, a bunch of status information. Um, the key here, though, is um, this file name here. That basically is something that you would use with Minicom or your some other terminal emulator of your choice. You connect, and oh, look at that. Okay. So if I type by, hey, look at that. Kestrel 3 DX4 version 1.2, right? So basically what's happening here is I'm running an emulator, uh, which actually I'd written some time ago, but I recently rewrote from scratch so that it'd be more maintainable and upgradable in the future um, because I want to start emulating uh, storage devices because right now there's no emulation of storage. So you can type all the programs you want, but like the Commodore 64 without a floppy drive or a cassette drive, it's gone as soon as you kill the power, right? Um, so this kind of got me to thinking, well, if I've got all of these uh, tools that I'm currently rewriting and such, um, especially for maintenance purposes, then I would like to write these development tools um, so that they are usable not only in a Linux environment under emulation, but also on live hardware. Right? So as I've demonstrated here, I'm that much closer to talking to live hardware. Um, but of course, the live hardware doesn't actually exist yet. Um, but, you know, I'd like to use the consistent tooling between what's on Linux and what's on live hardware. Uh, it's sooner rather than later. The problem is, I don't know if anybody's been paying attention. But the last time I gave a Kestrel update was about this time last year. So, uh, 360 some odd days later, um, I'm having a hard time remembering where I left off. Right? Um, so, this then led me to think, huh, okay, well maybe I can develop some kind of tooling support which will let me work um, within that constraint, right? And I can't think of anything better than literate programming, but the Donald E. Newth style of literate programming has a few problems. So I'm thinking uh, that maybe an alternative approach uh, would be usable here. So I wrote up a fourth uh, program to put that to the test. I haven't actually put it to the test yet, but I know that the tooling actually works. Um, so, um, Let's get started with the talk so that I can show you um, exactly uh, how this goes. So what is literate programming? So going back to Newth again, um, he is quoted as saying, I believe that the time is ripe for significantly better documentation of programs and that we can best achieve this by considering programs to be works of literature. So in other words, in Donald's mind, 
a program is the same as, say, um, a book that you would pick out from your local bookstore and you go home and you start reading, um, you know, by the fireplace and stuff. And so that's how he came up with the idea of literate programming. Um, this, this particular uh, um, clip of code is an illustration of C-Web. This is markup uh, for a computer game called Adventure. And basically this is how you would type in your markup. And you'll notice that it's not terribly pleasing to the eye. There's a lot of at signs and angle brackets and stuff like that. Essentially what you're doing is you're defining macros. Uh, it's a glorified macro expander. And uh, you'll notice that in some cases you can pass parameters and such like that. Um, this is what the finished result looks like in printed output. And as you can see, it is very pleasing to the eye. Right? It's got indices, it's got cross-references, it's pretty printed, um, and there's a clear separation between the program code and uh, you know, the descriptive text up above. Right? This is great, and I think from a, uh, uh, you know, from a structural uh, perspective, you know, like I said, it's easy to read. It's ex it can, it, in the hands of a master, it can be extremely elucidating. And there are measured known uh, benefits to software quality. But there are also uh, several problems with Newth's approach. The first is, if you need to fix a small bug, it's relatively difficult to do compared to, say, extreme programming, or uh, even some of the more heavyweight development processes, right? So here's a, uh, in fourth pseudocode, here's basically how you would try to find and resolve a small bug, right? Note that there's a double nested un begin until loop involved, right? Because you have to transitively dig down through these macro expansions before you finally find uh, the place that you need to fix the code. Not terribly, uh, you know, it's not, it in and of itself is not a, a deal breaker, but if you do this a lot, then it can certainly add up. Uh, but what if your problems are bigger? You know, how do you restructure the code, uh, which actually happens you know, quite frequently, not just when software is immature, but also uh, arguably even, even more often when the software is mature. It's like, oh, you know, we spent the last five years sinking all of our investment into this architecture, and now along comes, you know, uh, uh, Windows 10 with a new graphics driver architecture, and, you know, lo and behold, our game doesn't work, and now we have to re-architect the game, right? So, so this is something that uh, uh, is a very real um, uh, problem that that also affects mature software as well, and and how would you go about doing that? Now you've got to rewrite all the pros as well as all of the all of the code that goes into it. Um, I would argue that it is well. I write hard to communicate, but um, it's slightly clickbaity. I, I would say harder to communicate. Um, basically, you can't really show evolution of software. Right, going back to that rearchitecting issue. How do you go about um, elucidating why you make the decisions that you do? Um, people say all the time, you should always use code comments to explain why, not how. Um, but uh, there are actual cases where, you know what, if I see the, pr the, the problem in the sense of what was the pain point and then how you solved it, you know, and see the difference before and after, that can be incredibly elucidating and, and really help uh, with understanding the code and, and how to move forward with it. And probably the biggest problem that I have with it is you have to name things, a lot of things. In fact, every hunk has to have a name, uh, except for the root hunk. And, and this brings us right back to the same problem that we have um, with you know, fourth proponents versus C proponents. It's like, yeah, you have to name all, all, your, all your words, but you also have to name all your variables and all this other stuff, right? Um, it, and you have the same problem here. One of the, uh, uh, if you go back to, um, if you go back to this, you'll notice that there's, a, uh, there's two hunks here. You have simulate an adventure going to quit when finished, which explains exactly what that code is supposed to do and you understand it in a black box, right? That's good. Initialize all tables. 
Well, what does that mean? In the context of the game, it's basically meaningless. What tables? Doesn't say anything about that. And it's kind of open-ended. I guarantee you, if we were to look and dig through the, this uh, source definition, initialize all tables would probably expand to initialize this table, initialize that table, right? It, you would basically be a stepwise decomposition. Um, so in a sense, what we find here is this is conveying useful meaning right now, but this is really just a placeholder for some useful meaning later on. It's disclosing uh, a detail of the program that really doesn't need to be here. It's just kind of a distraction. Right, so basically what I'm going to discuss is an alternative approach um, where uh, Newth's approach, which we can describe as being top down, um, the alternative that I'm thinking of is a bottom up approach, basically applying a number of patches one on top of the other. Now, before I continue, um, all of my implementation actually is directly inspired by a person out on the internet, uh, Kartik Agaram. I hope I'm pronouncing the, right, the name correctly. Um, he has a website here called Basic Layers. Um, I, I would recommend uh, looking into this website. Um, he has uh, uh, a bunch of links to some documentation that uh, leads up to uh, his, fi his final implementation of that. Uh, and then, of course, I took it and ran with it in my own direction uh, as well. So I'm actually really quite, uh, um, uh, quite taken by this approach. The other reason why I like this approach is um, it leads to fundamentally much smaller uh, literate programming tools and much easier to uh, understand on their own. So let me, using C as an example, um, because um, C has sufficient complexity to help just, uh, justify how this works. We basically start with a simple patch, right? And in this particular case, it's the base patch. And in the top, we basically say, okay, you know, like all programs, we interact with the user by printing to the shell. Okay, or, or we, you know, continue on with some other description. And then we have a very simple hello world program. That is sufficient, it compiles, it runs on its own. And basically anyone looking to understand how the system works sees that there's not a whole lot of detail and it's easy to understand. Then when we want to communicate the next iteration on this, we come up with the second patch, again with a separate description block, that's where that, that comment comes in. But then you'll notice that these, these markup lines here, this after standard io.h, for example, we say include string.h. And similarly down here, we tell it to find the first line with printf, delete it, and then inject the rest of this code, right? So basically we're saying, okay, well, now that we understand how to do basic printing, now let's take a look and figure out how we do uh, command line processing in this particular example. Obviously this is all very contrived. And then in the third approach, you might have noticed that we missed over uh, an error handling case. For example, uh, a sharp-eyed person will recognize, well, I'm referencing an array index at i plus one, um, but I'm not doing any array bound, bounds checking, right? So here I'm introducing that, um, introducing that. And, uh, you know, again, I'm using after here and after here as um, commands, if you will, to the Tangle tool that basically says inject this code into this point here. Right. Now this is, uh, now this, in this particular example and in with my current tooling, uh, I basically target one output file. But there's no reason why this syntax cannot also support multiple output files. This is true of both the top-down and bottom-up approaches. Uh, I know that CWeb, for example, is, or historically has been only a single output file. Um, but NoWeb, for example, has historically supported multiple output files. Um, so, so basically, in both cases, you can do cross-cutting concerns. Um, but the nice thing about this is that you can roll back and roll forward. This is something that I find you cannot do with top-down approaches, right? So basically, I can say, well, let me take a look at the output of just doing one patch or the output of applying one and two patches and so on and so forth, right? So you can see how the basic structure evolves as you introduce new concepts into the program. Sharp-eyed people will probably say, huh, you know, 
Git, Mercurial, and a whole bunch of other distributed version control systems, or even non-distributed version control systems, they all work basically using a similar process. So what's the difference? Why would I use this in addition to and or instead of uh, a, a version control system? Um, I argue that you should never, ever develop software without using a version control system. That includes literate programming. Um, but the reason why you, uh, you would want to use the bottom-up literate pro programming approach, uh, in addition to uh, using a VCS, is they operate on different concepts. A VCS is designed to keep track of history, and especially minutia, very small changes. Um, whereas the literate programming is designed to introduce entire concepts. What's more is that um, you can actually go back and as you introduce new concepts, you may have to go back to earlier patches and refine them so that they can actually co collaborate uh, with, the, with the, uh, the later patches. Um, so in this particular case, you know, and I'm, I'm mentioning two levels of patches here, and I apologize if it's very confusing, but once you get your hands dirty with this stuff, um, it becomes more clear. Um, but basically, you can't really do that with a version control system unless you're using Git. You can do, you know, a Git push dash dash force, for example, to overwrite history, uh, or you can do, um, you know, squash merges and stuff like that. Um, but basically, um, you know, one, again, one is optimized for long form documentation, whereas the other one is optimized for, oh shucks, I forgot to, you know, to fix this bug or, you know, small ad, uh, administrative uh, updates like that. So let me give you a quick and dirty demo. I'm actually flying through this pretty fast. Um, so here, where am I? Let me start up a new terminal. CD. You get to the right directory. Okay, so you'll notice that I've got um, three files here. I've got basically the three that I that I mentioned earlier, slightly different, only in detail. So, for example, uh, you'll notice that uh, um, it's basically the same as the uh, the examples that I gave earlier. So, what I can do is I can say I can invoke um, the tangle command. I can give it an output file. And I can just give it the one uh, input file. And as you can imagine, it basically is a clone of the input file, minus all the markup, right? So if I do a quick uh, GCC out on that, right, it does exactly what you expect it to do. Now, on the other hand, if I um, tell it to work on all of the uh, input files, suddenly we have an entire C program with all the detail there, right? So if you look up, you know, obviously with this being such a simple C program, it, you know, it's, it's easy to see where the different sections are and what they do, but imagine that this is like a 4,000 line program. Right? So you can clearly see how the introduction of all of this detail could obscure the original intent of the software. And yet, um, when you do the compilation, it still works. And it does, right? It's still, and now we can demonstrate that it actually does accept command prompts and it does error checking, right? So basically what we've done is instead of relying so much on macro expansion, we've basically said, let's isolate different concepts and actually stratify them and then inject them into the code as appropriate, possibly even replacing existing code um, that is now obsolete as of that point in time. So some of the things that I anticipate on using this for, um, which I haven't obviously had the time to actually start just yet. Um, as I mentioned earlier, 
I'm starting to rewrite some of the tools in part uh, out of necessity, but also in part because the old language environments are no longer uh, uh, working for me. Uh, the Kestrel 3 assembler that I'm currently using to maintain my system firmware only runs on Python 2.0 right now. Yeah, I could fix it to run on Python 3. It's not that big of a deal. But as I thought, thought about it more, it's like, you know, it would be really nice once I have an assembler if I could just port that assembler very easily to run on the Kestrel itself. And right now I can't do that because in order to do that, I would need to port Python. To port Python, I would need to port C. And I would need to port POSIX runtime. And I would need to port sockets. And I would need to port. And I would need to port. And I need to... Yeah, it, it, it becomes a nightmare, uh, a, a massive dependency hell. Um, Kestrel 3 fourth rewrite. Um, I don't know if you noticed from the uh, start of the, uh, the uh, talk here, when I uh, rebooted the, uh, the, the fourth environment, you may have noticed that it only offered 48 kilobytes of dictionary space. The Kestrel 3 has a meg of RAM on it. So there, that there's an architectural uh, re-implementation that I need to do there. Um, I intend on porting a operating system by the name of Tripos. Uh, Tripos is a, uh, an OS uh, designed by Dr. Martin Richards, the same guy who designed BCPL. Um, it is also the foundation of AmigaDOS. Uh, for those who have never heard that term before but have used AmigaDOS, you've basically used, used Tripos. Um, so basically, uh, I'm looking to port that. Um, but also, those are the software examples. I'm also looking to uh, use it to implement hardware. And this is really one of the motivating factors. This is the part where I'm like, where was I? What was I doing? What was I thinking at the time? Why did I think this way? And, and is it, are my assumptions still valid, right? So those are, those are all questions that I run into. And every time I look at the source code for the CPU's hardware description, I'm like, Nope, I got to start over because I just can't remember enough uh, to know where I was going with this. And I'm sure that there's other things that I intend on using this with as, as I gain more and more experience with it. Um, the hardware description issue is going to be interesting because uh, the hardware description language is in nmygen, uh, which is uh, basically code written in Python. And uh, right now, my... Uh, Software does not respect uh, indentation levels, so it'll be interesting to see um, how it works with, uh, with Python and that. And that is basically it. I've got about, um, looks like eight minutes for Q&A. In your history, did you run across Will Baden's fourth literate programming? Um, did I run across Will Baden's literate programming? Uh, stuff. Um, I know that it exists, um, but I don't have any access or, or I've not seen it in, uh, in person. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, you have to have like a fourth, uh, I missed like, you might check it out, you missed it on the app itself. I'm, I'm sorry, give me one second. What was the question again? You have like a fourth, uh, like utilities or so for uh, like words or so for literate um, programming and forth, and I missed it at the beginning of this. Uh, like, a, like, a four, like a fourth word set to do this, or is it like more of a fashion? Um, yes, yes to both questions. Um, so so uh, in the absence of other, other questions, uh, it occurred to me that I have time to go through the, uh, the source code real quick. Um, so basically, everything starts um, with the 00bricky.fs. Uh, it's written kind of strangely um, because I'm looking to keep this both file compatible as well as block compatible. Uh, for various reasons. Um, but uh, basically, the whole program is starts out with just a bunch of includes. And uh, the invocation of that, uh, if you look at the Tangle script, um, basically builds a GForth 
script that invokes 00, zero bricky, right? So basically, all the command line uh, argument processing is translated into. Um, so let me uh, comment that out, for example. And I will show you. So if I do, so that's basically the output of that temporary file. So basically I say warnings off, I include that bricky script, and but then I use um, words um, file quote, for example, to in slurp in a file. Um, and then I use write quote to write out a particular, um, particular output file. And uh, that is, uh, so file quote in turn is the input handler. So if I go back into Bricky and take a look at this. Um, so basically we open a file um, and then we just read it line by line and process each line. And it's, it's at this level of abstraction, it's terribly dumb. But if we look at um, the directives file, we can see that there's um, a bunch of directives here process for example uh, we take a look we see if it's a if it's a directive if so we evaluate it verbatim as a fourth instruction which means that down here for example we have uh, you know open paren colon code um, which just resets the insertion point to the tail end of the output file um, we have top, which r sets the insertion point to the very beginning of the output file. But then here's where the uh, more interesting stuff happens. You know, here's after and before, for example. Basically, we take the rest of the uh, uh, input, um, you know, close paren delimited, for example, and uh, we search for it. And the first occurrence that we find in the uh, output file, we set that to be the insertion point or its immediate predecessor, depending on you know, the proper semantic that we want. Uh, delete does basically the same thing. Um, and what it does is uh, it will delete the, the, the line that it finds and then sets the insertion point to its immediate predecessor so that anything that comes after that replaces the deleted line. That's basically, that's basically essentially really it. I mean, the rest of this stuff is um, um, just administravia, really. Like, here's some low-level details about the list that I use. It's a it's a standard uh, Amiga-style doubly a doubly linked list, for instance. Yes. Sometimes when I write like fourth code, I write some application, maybe an IRC client, for instance. Um, and then I write it once, and then I scrap it, and then I rewrite it again. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found that like in, when I write fourth code, not so much with other languages, but in fourth, I found that like version control isn't as useful to me. Um, and, and I think like does that make me a bad person? I don't know, but um, yes. Um, I, I, I see like now that maybe I need, maybe I also need um, literate programming in a way, not just version control. Um, and yeah, I'm just thinking about like what's like where's the uh, the continuum between version control and literate programming? I'm not sure. Um, um, yeah. So so uh, I can't I can't live without version control. Um, this this software is all under version control. For example, yeah. uh, and there are there are actually several patches uh, against yeah. it, right? Um, because you know, as I develop this, it's like, okay, cool, I fixed it. You know, I fixed the bug. Blah blah blah. Yeah. Go to bed. Wake up tomorrow. New bug, new bug right? Yeah. Or new feature request, right? So so now, right? Yeah. Um, the ability to compare code is is vital. Uh, for example, um, but. Where, why would you use this versus a version control system? Because originally, I actually uh, thought about this. Um, that my first exposure to uh, Kartik's um, approach to literate programming, that was the first thing that came to my mind. Well, why, why don't I just use Git and, and just write 
my descriptions in, you know, the, the git commit logs. I mean, it's essentially the same thing, right? Technically, I suppose, yes, but, but then it's like, well, okay, I've written this big, long explanatory article inside this git commit log, and now I've got, you know, a bunch of tiny little fixes here and there. And then it's like, okay, well, now I've got to, um, you know, re-architect this whole section of code, and, well, now i got to, you know, now it's like, do I go back in the commit history and change that, or, you know, like, it opens up a bunch of, it opens up a can of worms that, that I don't think belong there. It's the wrong level of abstraction. Git patches are, tend to focus on minutia. They're very small in detail. Um, yes, you can get by with doing squash commits and rebases and stuff like that to kind of, and in fact, that's one of the reasons why, you know, large projects, they encourage or even require you to do rebasing and, and squash commits so that you can get rid of all that minutia and just focus your git commit logs and, and say, this is the salient thing. You know, this is addressing this particular bug. This is why I'm doing it this way. This is the algorithm that I use, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, whereas here, this allows me to get the benefits of documentation um, in a form, well, there's, that, that's one of the things, is, is it's in a form that is more humanly readable than a git commit log. I don't know about you, but reading git commit logs is a pain in the butt. I don't care how well uh, maintained it is. Uh, rather it be on, you know, Bitbucket or GitHub or even the, the out-of-the-box git, you know, git web uh, interface. It's terribly, it's just blah, right? You, it's, it's just not the right tool for that job. Whereas here, I can write my comments in Markdown. I can write it in HTML. I can write it in LaTeX. I could actually pretty print it and I can, you know, format it however I want. I could conceivably even include bitmap information by, you know, by linking and stuff like that. Um, whereas with Git, I can't really do that. There's no tool in, in Git that allows me to, to, to uh, recover that information. On the other hand, if I use this to record individual things like, you know what, there was, you know, somebody opened trouble ticket this, um, the problem was that, you know, that's the wrong place, you know, the, the documentation for why the code is the way it is, that's the wrong place to store that information. That is where um, the git commit log really comes in handy. And, and like I mentioned before, um, you know, you can actually, you know, if, if I wanted to go back and make a change, um, so if I go back and I say, you know, I introduce, you know, some new feature here, blah, and the only way that that actually works is if I go into, you know, the introduction, you know, the introduction, and I need an insertion point here or something like that, I could say, um, uh, we'll say end of main or something, you know, something innocuous there. Then I can say go back into 030 and say, you know, um, after end of main, etc. Do you see what I'm saying? Like I can go back and, and understand that I'm, ch yes, I'm changing the, 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 the base layer upon which everything else is built but I'm not changing history. There's a clear separation between changing history and changing the interface between the, between the layers involved. Does that make sense? History, you have you make a change, and then you um, clobbers the previous change from the perspective of the current working copy. But then, with literate programming, you have uh, you have uh, in this methodology, you have a, you don't. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to figure this out. You don't hide the. Uh, um, it, we might want to take this offline. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, because because basically, there's two axes that that we're looking at. We have the git commit history. Yeah or in this case, fossil commit history. Yep. And then we have the history, quote unquote, 
of the layers that are applied in the order that they're applied in. Okay, yeah. And they're, and they're, they, they are orthogonal issues. Yeah. 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 Um, so the, the git commit history is important because it tells you who made what change to what files yeah. and when, when, which is important to identify, okay, when was this bug introduced? It, exactly. This is this has nothing to do with identifying who introduced a bug or or you know what you know. It's not designed to uh, to facilitate problem isolation. It is it is, however, designed to facilitate education of how the program works and why it works the way it does. And that's and that's something that that tools like Git and Fossil are not optimized for. It's not to say that they can't be used for that, but there's it's just not the right communication channel for that. This is, this is like if you have a, um, a large like conceptual change like that would often result in scrapping and rewriting this method of code, this will help with managing that conceptual change. Exactly. Whereas, I would love to see a, uh, yeah. a little mind map of, of that process. I think that would really bring it home. Like a uh, mind map of Well, um, one of the first things that I am going to be working on is the new assembler. I have to have an assembler um, in order to proceed because I need the, the assembler to write the new version of fourth. But I also need to use the assembler to write um, the kernel code for the Tripos operating system. My problem is I don't want to have to write a separate assembler for fourth and a separate assembler for Tripos. And then of those two, write separate assemblers again you know, for Linux versus the Kestrel. Like, I want the same source code that runs on everything. And, or to the greatest extent possible. Obviously, there's going to be things that are going to change, right? Um, if it was also <laughs> Oh, you know, I think, I think I can pull off Pareto's distribution of, of uh, I think I can get to 80% of, of that utopia. Listing all of the, uh, um, the uh, your literate programming uh, comments or so, perhaps something like that. But you don't need to. You don't need to. It's, it's, it's a, that flow chart, the sort of uh, thing isn't really necessary in that case. But yeah, I mean, basically. It's not in the from a perspective of being like a history chronological chronology. It's not needed in that way, at least. Yeah. Yeah, because in, in order for this tool to work, you have to tell it specifically which, which files to apply and in what order, um, which, which you'll notice that the file names always start with numbers. Yeah. That's because in Unix, when you do file name expansion, it always sorts, yeah. right? So, so I take advantage of that, and that's, that's how that... Um, and, and you'll notice, like a basic programmer, I increment by 10. Yeah, so, so, <laughs> so basically, if I need to insert something in between two layers after the fact, I can say, well, okay, so instead of you know, going to patch 10 straight to patch 20, now I go patch 10 to maybe patch 15 and now 20, right? So I can actually inject stuff like that. Basic did it by tens because punch cards did it. You would, you would always leave you know, by hundreds or so with the, uh, the numbering of your lines for Fortran, the numbering of student ID numbers and so on, so you could keep adding people in alphabetic order. Right. It, it looks like you're, you're sort of aiming at uh, quilt with comments as, as opposed to git. Um, I'm not familiar with quilt. I'm uh, no, they, they are both tools that grew out, quilt and git both grew out of developing the kernel, the Linux kernel, uh, but git was developed for collaboration, quilt was for one guy to manage uh, kernel patches for his employer. Hmm. Okay, I'll, I'll take a look and, at that. And, and, it's, and it's a system for stacking, stacking code patches, mm -hmm. which is essentially what you're doing here. Yeah. But you've, you've added the, the uh, facility of comments. 
to the patch chunks. That's, that's, yeah. And, and, and basically the idea is, um, you know, and I only discussed the tangle aspect of this. There's also the concept of weaving, which is the production of the printed documentation as well. So, so basically you could step through each of these files and isolate, you know, what is the commentary versus the code and be able to pretty print the code accordingly as well. So theoretically, maybe it won't be as pretty as something from web, um, but theoretically it should produce a document that, um, you know, is equally as readable or, or nearly so. so. Cool, cool. Um, so yeah, so that's basically the project that I was working on. Um, and hopefully in months to come, we will uh, see, see uh, some of the results of actually using it. I look forward to playing with this and hopefully uh, getting some real, real world experience with this and seeing how it goes. Cool, and that's it, I think. Okay. Yes. So it looks like we're done for the day. So uh, we're going to uh, pack it in. And thanks everyone for watching the stream. And uh, um, hope you enjoyed. Looking forward to seeing you again uh, in the months to come. Adieu.